Hello and welcome to Intruder Alert, which is a new podcast from Cybery. I'm your host, Marcus Hutchins. Some of you may know me as Mawatech from social media. And this is our third episode. We do do this live. So if you're watching this on the live stream, uh, feel free to, uh, to throw in any comments you might have. Um, and we'll try and answer them towards the end of the show. I'm here with Ben, who uh, I think goes by Nahamsek. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but if you'd like to just uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, hi, I'm Ben. Uh, most people online know me as Nahamsek. I'm a hacker, content creator. Uh, I enjoyed you know, going to conferences and speaking at them. And uh, currently I'm full-time doing training, you know, offering training to people and making content. And a lot of people that you know watch recognize me is probably from my bug bounty days of you know hacking into organizations and then just uh posting about them online and talking about it yeah so i think a lot of viewers are going to be super interested in uh the bug bounty stuff and i i think the question i have to ask is like bug bounty is quite a like it's a fickle field you either you make like a couple of hundred maybe a couple of thousands and you just you give up or you end up making a living and you make like some really, really decent money. So in terms of like, I guess, firstly, what would you say would be the mindset difference between someone who makes a living in bug bounty and then following up, what would you say would be the skills to focus on? I think the the right approach would be to look at the other way around, to be honest. You, you know, it all comes down to your skill sets. It depends on how much you know. If you're someone who is very, very comfortable in, you know, ripping apart a, a web application, right, you're okay with spending countless hours of understanding what an application does, what the product does, what it's supposed to not do, what it's supposed to do, what information is valuable. You want to spend that time. And then you also kind of know how to read JavaScript to understand how things work in the background. It's going to be easier to make money from bug bounties um, than someone that doesn't do, do any of that stuff, right? So it's um, it's really a effort meets skills and how much patient you have. Unfortunately, you see a lot of people join bug bounties or even you know want to do hacking because of the money aspect of it. Uh, I'm sure when you first started getting into information security and hacking yourself, money wasn't the thing, right? It was the pure curiosity of how much you love doing the things that you love, then. Then eventually you found there is a way to make money from it. There is you know, things that you can do that leads to money. And that's when things get a little weird and different. Um, but you're absolutely correct. You know, there is a market that people could make either no money, they can make a couple hundred bucks, or they can make a living off it full time. And a lot of that comes down to just how much effort you want to put in. And um, if you want to stay persistent, like anything else you do in life. Yeah, I definitely think that's uh, one of the valuable things that I guess we kind of got lucky, lucky with it getting in at that time when it was very, very, like InfoSec wasn't really a thing back then, right? It was just kind of, you, you were interested in computers, you wanted to mess around, you wanted to learn some things. Mm -hmm. And then by the time this like big industry propped up, it was kind of like you had all the skills you needed. Um, yeah. I think my uh, another question would be like I see a lot of people when they talk about bug bounty some go for the route of just find like the low hanging fruit automate it as much as possible and just like carpet bomb the bug bounties and then some other people they go far the other way with the let's spend like eight nine months of my life digging through the iOS kernel get like that that big payout and then like retire for a few months uh, what would be your advice? Uh, I think there is, so the low hanging fruit with, with, um, bug bounties is something that you see. They're still, they're still there, right? Don't get me wrong. You can still find this low hanging fruit, but with, if this was prior to 2020 with all the new open source tools that have came out in the past couple of years, the low hanging fruit was easy to find. You, know, you run a script, you know, you have these tools like Nucle now that you just start a template and it finds you stuff. Back then you had to know how to do these things on your own to be able to spray an entire company's infrastructure for a single endpoint without, you know, getting blocked. But now you have all these tools, you have the distributor scanners, you have these distributors tools that you can run on these different VPS and not get caught and find vulnerabilities. But I think those are going to get phased out even more in the next couple of years. And you're going to really see who's going to be around because they're willing to do exactly what you said, spend months at a time on an application, whether you know, you're doing kernel bugs with iOS or whether it's just purely understanding the ins and outs of this web application, you know, a huge application that's out that is multi-million dollar company that does a bunch of different things. You can't learn all that in a couple of weeks, right? You're going to spend months and months and months and you at some point you're going to know probably more or as much as our developers. <laughs> um, and that's when you make a lot of your money and you know, that's what I the 
the advice for me pers- personally would be you have to start somewhere. So if you're going to start with the low-hanging fruit, don't make that your bread and butter because it's going to eventually phase out. You're going to not make money and you're going to get burnt out. So really focus on that as a driver to make money so you can build motivation, build your momentum, but also continuously learn new techniques and new strategies to find vulnerabilities where you don't have to look for low-hanging fruit. And if you find an RCE that's worth $15,000 once a month, twice a month, you're making a good amount of money, right? Yeah, like I I noticed a really big shift with, uh, like I'm more on kind of the binary exploitation side. So like fuzzing was the big thing. And then, of course, you had these, uh, I think it was like, I don't remember what it's called, but the Google uh, vulnerability group. And they have like infinite cloud resources. They have all of the compute power in the world. And it's like, I cannot compete with that. I physically like I do not have the computing power. Yeah, and it's the same thing with the low-hanging fruit, right? You have the, the new bug bounty hunters that are going to get into this. They're not going to spend, you know, hundreds of dollars in some, you know, gear or not their, their servers to scale their work. And you have these top hackers who know how to distribute their scans within a few boxes, and they can scan an entire, you know, uh, an entire IPv4, for example, in a couple of hours, and you can't keep up with that in the beginning. So, yeah, it's definitely pick and choosing your battles. But at the end of it with bug bounty, it's, it's a lot about impact. So you can find low-hanging fruit, but you're not going to make a whole lot of money and you're just going to be doing more quantity over quality that makes you the most money. Mm. So uh, what would you say would be like the the top three skills for someone who's like just looking to get into this for the first time? Uh, there's a few things. One is, um, I don't want to say basics of like computer science because that's such a broad term to say, but you have to know the basics of computer science. But in the aspect of like bug bounties, it's like computer science meets web. You know, one of the best advice is to tell people what happens when you, this is very simple and easy, but a lot of people can't explain to you what happens when you type in a domain into your address bar, right? What are the different DNS requests that happen? What are the HTTP headers that are sent? What are the HTTP requests that are being sent to the server? What does that process look like? Understanding all of that and knowing what goes in the in a blender of like a website of what are the different things that happen for you to load a website on the back end, what does the server do to load the website for you? Those are all the different pieces you need to understand. So if you have a you know background in like web dev, great, that helps you a lot. But if you don't, then you really have to be able to understand how these things work. So that's the number one thing that I would say. It's basics of web that could include networking, it could be web dev, it could be computer science, whatever you want to label it. It's such a broad terminology, but it's just understanding how websites work. The second one is you have to understand hacking, right? You have to understand what web hacking is like. So going and learning, uh, OWASP top 10 is not something that I want to recommend anymore because of how often it changes, but some sort of a framework where you learn different vulnerability types that are popular in web applications. And if you want to do mobile or I don't know, if you want to do other avenues of bug bounties, those are also similar. You have the top 10 techniques or whatever it is. So that's number two. You really have to understand not only how these vulnerabilities work and why they work and also how to exploit them. Um, I see a lot of times, believe it or not, people just copy paste payloads and that doesn't work, right? <laughs> it doesn't right. work. You miss vulnerabilities and in some context, your payload not, is not going to work. You know, in, in some cases, it's not going to work. So instead of the the payload thing and, you know, what payload to use, more think so, why does this payload work? How do I create a payload that works with a small ability? And then the third one, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good one to have, I think, it's just a reconnaissance process. Being really in the reconnaissance doesn't have to be like just identifying asset and identifying content, but also like threat modeling for that organization is kind of a part of your recon process. What is so important to this company, right? Let's use um, Airbnb, for example. Outside of a SQL injection and outside of cross-site scripting, these vulnerabilities that you see, what's important to Airbnb? It's the address of the properties. It's the address of people that are, you know, the host, address of guests, their information. Those are important to them, right? It's considered to be the most valuable information on there. And how do you find those things? So it's kind of like goes into your threat modeling of what's important to them, what assets are important to them, and prioritizing those uh, as you're bug hunting. That's some solid advice. I think um, one thing I also found quite helpful was um, just like reading other people's write-ups. Um like I, I haven't done a lot of web stuff, but in the binary exploitation, it's always like the same mistakes. And you, once you know the mistakes that the developers make, you can find the exact same bug in the exact same code base written by the exact same person. And it's just like, it's so easily reproducible. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, hacking at a core is a pattern of mistakes, right? 
It's mm-hmm. not, it's not how they make them, uh, what mistakes they make. It's how they make that mistake, right? So if that pattern is repeating and you know how to identify a particular mistake, it's just easier to export it across multiple web applications. It's you know cross site scripting, for example. It's uh, one of the easiest ones, right? The the, the, the error there or the, the mistake there is always the same thing. They forget to validate users' inputs and you know, you know sanitizing it. If you know that, then it's easier to look for it. And yeah, you're absolutely right, man. It's uh, it's the same mistakes. You just find them across multiple volumes. You just have to know how to identify those patterns. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I kind of want to ask, like, what would you say is, uh, I guess, first, the funniest vulnerability you found? And second, the, like, the either the craziest or most impressive? Um, the funniest vulnerability is always... Um, it's the typical like is admin admin going to work (laughs) (laughs) believe it or not dude you'd be surprised how many times admin admin or admin password works oh that's depressing Uh, that is probably one of the best ones and the most crazy one um that i can talk about publicly is probably uh either my snapchat or uh lift bugs that i found a couple years ago uh, those are the ones that I can publicly you know, talk about because they're disclosed. But it was kind of impressive to find the Lyft vulnerability because the story is about me being on an airplane night to go to a conference in Chicago. And in my expense for the company I used to work at, Hacker One back in the day, I'm putting like a the note, like, what is this ride for? You know, I took this Lyft ride from my house to the airport. And I'm like, oh, new functionality. I can put in an expense thing right here, like a note. Haha, ha, what happens if I put an HTML injection in there? Is it going to work? <laughs> right? You laugh at it and you go, it's not going to work. So I put it in, I go into the airplane and I go on and I'm like, okay, I'm going to find my expenses really quickly for whatever I've done for this trip so far. So I download the PDF and what do you see? There is an HTML in the PDF rendered, but this requires me to take a ride every time I want to export it. So I'm calling my buddy, uh, shout out to him, Donut. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. I call, I'm texting him on, on my phone uh, in a Slack or whatever it was on, on the plane. And I go, hey, dude, like I sent him a screenshot. I go, this is for real happening. Can you help me out? So this guy is taking two-minute rides in San Francisco from his job <laughs> on his lunch. He's going to a Starbucks, not ordering anything, and taking a lift back from Starbucks to go back to his office just so we can confirm this works. So that's like, it's, you know, it's a little things like that that happens. And then later I met with my buddy Dakin and the both of us were taking rides around New York so we can finally exploit this because we found the vulnerability, but we couldn't exploit it. And we dropped an O-Day on the backend uh, system that we're using. It was Weezy Pen or something like that. And you know, we were able to exploit it. But it's just impressive because one, it was just funny. And then it's Lyft. It's a huge company and you could access, you know, we have access to all their, AWS keys at this point, whether it was gated or not, we don't, we'll never know, but it's just impressive because of how many people was involved and me being on a plane asking people to give a ride and that kind of stuff. That's incredible. And just like picturing you all just like going around in circles in like the bay or something. Yeah, there's a video on it. Uh, my buddy Stoke made a, con- you know, a piece of content on us years ago. If you go watch it, you can see the, you can see the excitement and the anger, you know, that I'm going through. It is roller coaster emotions of like, Okay, payload's going in. Is it going to work? No, it doesn't work. And then we try it again. We keep going up until we export it and it works. So this was like a, like an HTML injection or something that like rendered on the back end? Yeah, so the HTML injection rendered on the PDF, which was server-side. And you know, when you do server-side requests like an SSRF, you can actually talk to internal resources. So we were able to... Uh... So we were able to pull AWS keys, we were, re- we were able to read local files on the machine, and you name it, we could have done it on that uh, PDF generator. And props for that, because I, I go crazy just trying to get my exploit payloads to work like on my machine, not having to like take an, an Uber every time. <laughs> yeah, what's even crazier is we have to do all of it on our phone. So I'm constantly on my phone. Like, I'm trying to type in the payloads and you, know, you have to make sure it looks good and it works. So it's not the most fun, but it was pretty entertaining. That's amazing. So you do uh, like, I think you do like a lot of uh, bug uh, like on the other side of bug bounty now right you uh you work for um are you still at the same company i'm haven't checked no. in in a while no so i've actually taken the the content creation road and doing more on educational stuff but previously i did work for one of the bug bounty platforms hacker one for a good six seven years to help build their community and make bug bounties better for them then i worked for some asm company and then now i'm doing a lot of uh you know, content and educational stuff for people that want to get into cybersecurity and hacking. 
So from like your side on working for a bug bounty company, is there any like a uh, unique insight or advice you would give to people from kind of that end? <laughs> this is going to sound a little bit uh, funny, but people have this like misconception that um, there are times that they're right about what I'm going to say next is that like, if this bug bounty program doesn't pay, the person saying no to you is going to benefit from it. Like, you know, it's not their budget. It's a company's budget. They want to spend that money on security. So there's this misconception of like, oh, they don't want to pay for my bug because they want to save money. That's maybe sometimes a company is, you know, a little bit cheap and they want to save money on their budget. But a lot of times they don't care. The money doesn't come out of their pocket. And then always, you know, there's all these assumptions of they don't care. You know, they're doing it on purpose and people think, take things very personally and i want to just say it's not like that there's so many different people so many different groups of people that are involved in a bug bounty program that is insane to deal with it you know a giant corporation that has thousands of employees their legal team gets involved with the bug bounty program do you know how hard it is to talk to a legal team about hacking <laughs> right it's the it's, a, it's the last thing you want to do at a, at a company is talk to your legal team about wanting to pay some hacker in some random country in the world Right, it's not easy to do a bug bounty program. It's really a lot of work, and I'm not just saying that because I've been on that side. It's just, it's very tiring when you're on the organizing side and you see all these like hurdles these companies have to jump, you know, jump through or these hoops have to jump through just to get a bug bounty program up and running. Yeah, like it's it is a crazy thing. Like I've had friends working, uh, like just trying to get the company to like hey, we're going to pay people for vulnerabilities. And they're like, what's this? This sounds like ransom, so we can't do this. Yeah, it's insane, dude. Like, If you think about 10 years ago, if you wanted to disclose something, it wasn't as easy. People weren't no. open-minded to it, right? Like a small export on an open source project, it wasn't fun to disclose things. The first person that would have always replied was a legal team, usually. So we've come a long way as an industry to be okay to pay hackers to hack into your stuff. Yeah, it's it is it's crazy how far we've come. Like I remember having friends; they would, it they wouldn't even like disclose publicly. They would email the company, be like, "Hey, I found this vulnerability. I'm not asking for anything. Just like just go ahead and patch it." Yeah. And they would act as if they had just been hacked, and the hacker was like ransoming them. Yeah, and you also had those like exploit days of like you know Mellowworm or whatever <laughs> platform you wanted to do. People were scared of using their real name to report things, so they were just dropping them on those company on those platforms. I mean, even look at the cybersecurity educational space, right? You know, when you, you know when you probably started or I started, even there wasn't these like you know free labs we could use. You know, it was if you you know you had to know where to hang out to learn things. You had to know what forums to be on, what IRC channels to be in, or servers to be in, so you could see someone doing something cool and then learning from them or you know doing the same stuff, right? We yeah. didn't have the the luxury of hack the box dropping binary stuff for us to export to learn or making a web CTF for us to learn. That's a setting for you to hack on. It just was you had to be connected to the right people, had the right you know, corner of you know market or network to work with that today you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Yeah, like that was actually a big part of what got me into um like first content creation and then uh doing work with Cybrio on like making free courses because like it wasn't even that long ago, but when I was growing up, as you said, it was you had to know the forums. And always the downside was like most of those forums were just like straight up crime. Like they mm -hmm. were it would be very easy to just end up on a forum and you would learn the skills, but then you'd be surrounded by people who wanted to just like break into companies yeah. um, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And these weren't like today's like, you know, you have all these, you know, quote unquote, dark web and Tor, Tor websites. These are just random for that anybody could have gone to. You could have just found them through a group of friends and anyone could access. And you're right, dude, it wasn't for security purpose. It wasn't for research. It was just straight up people trying to do malicious things. And then you would see them do it. But that was the, the way you would learn, right? But now we have these different conferences we have these different trainings we have these different communities of discord to join to learn from each other when it's not just people with malicious intent or adversaries who want to do whatever it is for their personal gain yeah i remember like the old days it would be it would be like the most blatantly illegal software it would be like some credit card stealer and if yeah. like it's for educational purposes um yeah. like please agree to the terms of service <laughs> yeah wing educational purposes <laughs> But yeah, it is that though. That was the reality of what it was in the early 2000s. Even, you know, up until 2015, I want to say it wasn't 
as easy to get your hands on things. And yeah, looking back at it as an industry, we've come a long way, but it's just, I think people that are getting into cybersecurity, you know, hacking, whatever you want to call it, ethical hacking nowadays, you have a lot more resources, you have a lot more community support and more communities that are publicly available to you than what we did uh, years and years ago. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a viewer question just come in. It says, um, so is it still worth the effort to get into bug bounty? Is it like now saturated or too complicated to get a good start? Um, I think there is. So okay, let me let's let's look at this question from a perspective of what is your final goal, right? Is your final goal to become a bug bounty hunter that lives with a bug bounties full time? That's going to take a lot of more work and effort than it did, you know, six seven years ago, because there is as much as there's more bug bounty hunters and hackers that are available, we have the same amount of programs that are being launched, new companies that are launching programs. But as an industry, again, we have came a long way better. We're doing better, even though we still suck at security, but we're doing a lot better, I feel like, there's because there's more education around it. So it is harder to break in as a bug bounty hunter. But if your um, your goal is to become either someone that does bug bounties as a stepping stone to get a job no and it's never too late because you can go hack on vdps where you don't make money vdps are the vuln disclosure programs like your ibm gm and i'm not saying you should do that full time because you're putting your time and effort into it but it's a great way for you to learn and have a real world experience to put on your resume and say hey I have identified SQL injection on XYZ company. I have found cross-site scripting on this XYZ company. And that's honestly how I got my first job, is with just doing bug bounties that way with whatever company I could hack on ethically through bug bounties and full disclosure programs. So it is in a way saturated if you want to get into the, the get make money, but it all comes down to what your end goal is. And I know people that I just started two or three years ago that are making a killing out of it, but their approach is different than most people that found something that is their niche. They're really good at it and they're making a killing out of it. Yeah, I think that's some absolutely underrated advice. Um, it was a similar story of how I got my first job. I um, I didn't get it through like the work I did. Like it was all for free. I just published it online, but it was the publishing, the write-ups and the like, here like it was basically like the equivalent of a certification i just had this yep. blog of all of these things i had done and i think that is one of the the best ways to get into the industry like start a bug bounty blog start doing hack the box like just find something to prove your skill and then just write about it and it also goes like beyond the the technical skills of it right of wanting to get a job a lot of the hiring managers look at how you learn things how often you learn them how do you communicate them can you communicate that technical aspect to somebody else and that also you know helps a lot of that stuff with bug bounty specifically if you find a security research to do whether it's you know looking at applications with cross site scripting it's something random right or looking you know for my case i did ssrf owning cloud environments through ssrf and pdf generators that's a huge research to do and that was six years ago five years ago right but that is what gave me a boost in my career because I took a step back while I was making money and going, I'm going to do actual security research that could show something that I've worked on that I've learned. And that alone is the most valuable thing you can showcase on your website to, you know, to get a job. And it's a really good, you know, bug bounties are a, I call them a playground for security research because you have these real organizations that you can hack into to prove something as a part of your research. And, you know, um, people like Asset Note, Shubs, uh, Shabham Shah, the CEO of Asset Note, he's a prime example of it. He's done bug bounties. He's you know now finding you know O days in software are used by the enterprise like VMware stuff that he's finding vulnerabilities and bug bounties are giving him a place to showcase his vulnerabilities and then now he's building a product out of. It. So there's like you have these all these tools. It's just how you utilize bug bounties for your personal you know career or your, whatever your goals are. Yeah, like I, I really think that's one of the things that a lot of people miss is the communication and the writing side. Because you'll get these people and they're like the best hackers on earth. And they're like, man, I just, I can't find a job. And you, I think like probably the biggest indication I saw of this was Microsoft, their bug bounty program. There's like a, a 15K bonus if you write a report that isn't garbage. Like yeah. it's like you found a bug. Uh, and you can you can just write a report and we'll pay you. But if you write a report that's actually good and communicates the intent, then we'll just give you more money. Yeah, I think it's a it's a soft skills that we have. You know, people that are wicked smart. The soft skills soft skills aren't usually there, and that's because 
they're just built different, dude. It's just the way they think is different. And the expectation is that everyone understands what you're doing in some aspect. But you're absolutely right. Uh, communication and it's just putting your house, putting yourself out there is a huge part of wanting to you know, score a job. Uh, networking is key. Uh, you know, going to the conferences, talking to people, putting yourself out there, and just knowing how to communicate communicate with your community is a huge, huge thing. Yeah, I've always found a big uh, amount of value in conferences. Not going to the talks per se, but just like talking to people. There's like there are people you will run into at conferences you would not believe. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you do the same thing when you go to Black Hat and DefCon. Black Hat may be different, but DefCon, I don't think you you know you spend much time at the conference itself. It's just usually who you run into at the the lobby of DefCon, who you run into at the bars that, that are at the hotels that are talking to, who's doing uh, drinks with friends that you rub shoulders with and you just become friends with, or you go, oh yeah, I've talked to you on Twitter. I've talked to you on this group that you were on. I think that is the, the beauty of going to these conferences and talking to people. I, I've honestly, you know, go, I've been going to DefCon for I don't know, 10 years now, maybe nine years. And every year I've just made more and more friends just by, you know, looking at Twitter and seeing where everybody else is going and just showing up. Even if it's a corporate events that are happening, the after parties that are happening, going to them, it's it's more fun and valuable than the talks. You can learn stuff from the talks, but you get to meet and really have, you know, one-on-one conversations with a lot of people at these events. Absolutely. And as you say, even the corporate events, they they always turn out to be a lot more fruitful than you think they are. <laughs> Yeah, it's always fun seeing the the DefCon parties and the Black Hat parties every year in <laughs> Vegas. Even RSA recently, my RSA is doing some. You know, people that are going to RSA they're doing some crazy parties. But yeah, I re- really recommend going to them. It's free; you're not paying for anything. Yeah, you may have and the alcohol is free. And the alcohol is free. <laughs> you know, with the the event, you just have to stand in line or show up. You're just stupid early to get in. But it's just you know, being at those parties, I think you get to really meet a lot of people. Mm, absolutely um so i next segment is somewhat related to self-education it's like with this ability to just learn hacking easily online uh, a lot of people are getting into like vigilantism and activism uh do you have re- like really much experience with that side of uh, those people or any thoughts uh i think <sighs> hacktivism is a beautiful thing if you're doing it for the the right purpose and the right reason i don't um I don't support it in a lot of ways because it always turns out to be more, but I, I don't have experience with it. But I have a friend of mine, uh, Ryan Montgomery, aka O'Day. He does some crazy vigilante stuff with hacking and what he has learned through hacking. Uh, he has a, you know, he just recently was on a show. He was done a podcast also on this that he ended up uh, hacking in one of these uh, online forums that was built for, um, illicit content that involves kids mm. and he connected to the government person and i don't want to drop the names There's, all this is public by the way but if you look at that he talks about how he finds a government official who was the owner of the website you know talks to lawyers gets them and then now he's doing these uh you know catching a predator kind of things through his skills and it, I think in those cases, it's you're walking a very fine line of the the legal realm of what you can do with hacking. But could you imagine hacking these like forums that are spreading yeah. all these information about other people or kids, and then being able to get it shut down? I think it's a, it is a, it's a, it's it's a very fine line that you're walking. But it's also really cool to hear some of these stories that are coming out of it. Yeah, I definitely think it's legally questionable, but it's like who is going to be the person to prosecute that person? Like who wants to stand up there in front of the jury and be like, I'm going to send to get to jail the guy who was protecting kids. Like, but it's also I've, scary if you think about it though, because cyber criminal, like the cyber, cyber crime gets a lot of more years in prison. It feels like than some of the other crimes in the real world that are way worse than doing the stuff that people do as criminals, even if it's for vigilante reasons. Right. Yeah, they, they really like to stack their charges. I think when I got charged, um, my total estimated jail time would have been 70 years, like maximum. And that is insane because, I, yeah, it's just insane. It's 70 years. It's like life in prison at this point, even though they're just atta- you know attaching years to it. Uh, but it just shows that you know people aren't educated enough inside the cybersecurity realm. But yeah, I mean, it is, a, it is an you know, interesting thing to see with... Uh, 
some other government stuff that's happening, not in the U.S. alone, but uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries. I've seen recently a lot of like information being hacked out of the government websites that mm-hmm. you know connects them to other crimes that's happened in the world or other deals that were supposed to be upheld by the governments against you know other nations. It's interesting seeing these come out of hacktivism, whether or not it's for a good cause. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there is. It just comes down to the the legality of the. You know, just like what you said, who's going to, first of all, what country are you in? And then yeah. two, what jury is going to say, oh, this vigilante that, you know, brought down a, you know, so-and-so that was doing something with child, uh, with, with children at least. And, you know, who are you going to charge? The hacker that brought him into, you know, the custody or the person that's coming at the crimes? Yeah, like, in at least in the U.S., I know that's not a good look to go after people on that much of the right side. Um because obviously they have to they have to explain it to a jury and the jury is going to be like thinking hang on a sec why are we why are we here yeah when i heard uh ryan's story he's talked about it a little bit i was just like holy crap like i just want to know what was the conversation you had with your lawyer <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what, what did you tell them and why, why did your lawyer handle it but i guess he figured it out somehow and uh they brought down the entire forum and the person in charge is now uh, you know being prosecuted yeah, usually I believe there's some kind of protection, like it's kind of like whistleblower protection, where if um, you essentially can position yourself as a witness to a crime, at which point the crimes you committed can be uh, not pardoned, but um, whatever the the retroactive version is. Um, but, of some sort. Yeah, but the obviously the problem is you don't know whether they're going to give you that going in, so it's always playing with fire a bit. Yeah, I think it's also who you are as a person, you know, mm-hmm. what track record you have. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it is kind of scary, but it's, yeah, it's cool. That's one of the only stories that I've heard recently about, you know, the vigilante hackers who have done something completely different than, you know, what, what I do or maybe what you do as well. Yeah, it's, I, I've really enjoyed those stories. Like there's some uh, some very good writers who like to write them up in these like big, long profile pieces. And I, I just love them. Wow, I think they have to look into them. I haven't really read a bunch on those. Uh, but yeah, Ryan's probably the only one that I've uh, came across. So um, I think we have another audience question here, which is, I've landed an internship learning about a role I want to grow into, but it's unpaid. Is it worth it to gain the experience or should I hold out for a paid role? Um, with the current economy in the U.S., I'm honestly not sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it um, depends. Like... If you're someone right out of college or you're still in college, depends on a couple of factors, right? One is your your lifestyle is a big one. Are you able to, you know, are you living with your parents and you don't have to worry about your bills and that kind of stuff? Then sure, why not take that position, especially if it's a big tech company that's going to great, you know, look great on your resume. But if you're someone who's, you know, going to college, paying for your own tuition, you know, paying for your own bills and you don't have a lot of funding, that's going to make it hard. I personally think it's depending on, again, your goals, if it's a big if it's a company that's in the industry that you want to go into, I think it's really valuable to go work for them because you get to learn the ins and outs from somebody else. But if you can't afford it financially, then it doesn't make sense to do something like that. Uh, I personally have never done a paid uh, unpaid internship. I was lucky enough to be able to get some sort of a, you know, it wasn't a lot, but it was still something that helped me with my bills. Uh, and you know, if you're okay to settle with that, it's also doable. You know, you don't have to, you know, you can always ask for something very small that pays for your you know, monthly dues of your bills, uh, whether it's something small or not. But at the end of it, I think um, with the right company, it's worth it because that could look great on your resume eventually when you want to apply for a job when you leave college. Yeah, my, my kind of thinking is like, firstly, I guess in this economy, but uh, as you said, they could be... Um, uh, they could be a college student who doesn't have bills to pay yet. Yeah. Um, I think my advice there would definitely be, um, I don't think there is any legal way you can be tied into an unpaid internship. So I think you're free to just continue seeking a job while you're doing it. Yeah. So if you're not in a hurry to get a job um, or you're seeking a job actively, it might just be worth uh, keeping up with the internship, get the experience. And then the second you find something paid, just uh, hop on out of there. Yeah, I agree. I think um, it's a good um, temporary thing to do while you look. And also you can put that internship on your resume too, that you have worked at this company and you have done a little bit of internship work. Absolutely. This is a fun one. (laughs) A career in tech has made me seriously sedentary. 
what are some things to uh, do to get outside of the computer? Oof, that's a hard one. <laughs> because like, if you play video games, you're still on the computer. Yeah. Right? I can't say go play video games. It depends on the type. Uh, I used to be the type that didn't really enjoy outdoors in the earlier years. I didn't really enjoy going you know, hiking and stuff. As I've gotten older, I've grown to learn and to like it and enjoy it more. Um, honestly, it just depends on what you like to do. Reading has been a big one for me recently. Uh, whether it's just you know reading 20, 10 minutes a day, it's just something that you know push, pushes me away to go out of the computer, outside of my room in this office with the computer. Uh, there's other things you can... Um, you know, I have a dog, so I have to walk my dog regularly. I got a dog. I don't recommend getting a dog just for that reason, but <laughs> getting a dog could be a good way to get you go out of a house and have someone to hang out with. Uh, you know, trying to do setting time aside at every week or every two weeks to go and do dinner with friends or lunch with friends, coffee with friends to get out. And all that depends on what you do. It's just having hobbies that are outside of computers. I feel like it's very important. Uh, burnouts are a real thing for a lot of us that work in the industry, and a lot of it stems from us being just stuck in the room. Um, you know, stuck in the same room for whatever reason is, whether you're playing video games in the room or working, you're still in that same location, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Yeah. I think the most underrated thing is the extrovert friend who just like forces you to go to things. Like <laughs> I, I, they, they've saved my life so many times. I mean, I've had like, I, it wasn't my extrovert friend, but one just like came up to me and was like, get in, we're going to Hawaii. And like, that was, that was that. But, um, I, I think I also recommend like just find like a sport. It doesn't have to be something like a team sport that you do with friends, but just like I like to swim, I like to cycle. Um, okay. A really good one I found is get an electric bike because then you can have the fun of going fast and also the fun of like getting a little bit of a workout, uh, like get the hybrid one where it has a motor, but the faster you pedal, the more it boosts the motor. Uh -huh. And then just go around town, put your headphones on, get some some good tracks going. And those things are just so much fun because they will go like 30 miles an hour. Wow, okay. Yeah, I think, um, one, I didn't know those exist actually. I've seen them, I just didn't know how they worked but that sounds uh yeah i think anything you can get yourself to go outdoors whether it's for sports or some sort of an activity to go walk around or pedal around or whatever it is it's a it's a very good way to just get out of the computer um i've tried these uh this sounds like a little bit of a weird and different one but there is these flotation rooms you can go to where oh you, those are great you've have you done those <laughs> yeah dude those are really really cool i do one every couple of weeks and you just go in and it's like dark room it's a it's a bathtub you just lay and just float and you can't take your phone in there it's wet there's you know salt in that water but the hour that i get out you know and i do that every couple of weeks it's been very helpful to just not worrying about my phone going off not worrying about the computer not worrying about anything that happens and just play this vibey music that you just float to yeah, that's a solid one. The uh, the spas, like there's some, uh, I think, Korean spas and stuff that yeah. are absolutely amazing experience. Um, but yeah, I think underrated advice also is just turn off the phone. Like you've got to go somewhere where your phone is not with you because it's so easy to just get hooked to it. Like I've been there. I've been the person who like I take my phone everywhere. The second a Slack mm -hmm. uh, notification pops up, I'm I'm there and it's just it's not healthy yeah the um, i think that one of the cool things is i do these uh random like challenges whether it's like a monthly challenge you know every couple of weeks right now i'm doing something called the four by four it's four weeks with four rules and the number one is like we cut out you know alcohol and whatever substance cigarettes if you smoke whatever it is that you your vice you know you just a detox for your body um one of the rules that's really really cool and being very fun to do is uh no phones or no screens whatever you want to call it it's up to you but the no phone one hour before sleep has been very fun to not have to look at my phone because you know if you think about it you're watching a movie for example on the couch and your phone's on you so you naturally grab your phone and start texting people or talking to people or doing whatever it is it gets you distracted that has been a fun one to say hey that last hour i'm gonna i charge my phone away from my room now so i charge it in my office and i'm in my bedroom um so it's just putting it away for the hour gives you just a good way to disconnect and not worry about it till the next day. That's a solid one. Just the charger goes the absolute other side of the house. Just and you don't wake up to your phone either, right? Like you don't wake up to your emails or your, whatever your notifications are, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, email, whatever. You don't wake up, roll over and look at your phone. That's a good one because I, I have like the wireless charger on my nightstand. Oh, yeah. and the first thing, it's on the phone. Yeah. 
So we have, um, I think, one more question here, which is aside from um, CompTIA um, uh, A+, and CompTIA Network+, Plus, what certifications would you recommend for a be uh, beginning a career in cybersecurity? I am the absolute worst person to ask about security certificates yeah. <laughs> because I don't believe in them. But I know I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, really take certificates seriously and they do a lot of them. Uh, Pentest Plus has been a decent one to get into like cybersecurity and understanding some of the basics from a attacker perspective or, you know, not when I'm being on the defensive side. I know uh, the Cyber Mentor has some really good entry level, you know, getting into ethical hacking. I think it's PNPT, the pr practitioner I don't know, something, I, I don't know what the acronym is all, but he's got a really decent one. Uh, but if you have a little bit of money and you, you can get a sponsorship of some sort, uh, I think the offensive security uh, professional, the uh, OSCP, the certified professional, is one of the better ones that it's being updated more than anything else. But I think it's a really good one just for the purpose of getting past the HR for getting a job or, you know, applying for a job. Unfortunately, they look for those kinds of things. And I think certificates are a really good place to demonstrate that you've learned some stuff and it really gets you past the HR aspect of getting a job and getting a job interview. Yeah, and I think a lot of companies will sponsor you, uh, like if you're in an internship or something. Mm -hmm. So that's like usually the best route to go because those things are expensive. And yeah. like I would never recommend saving, like unless you're rich, don't yeah. be like scraping together pennies to spend like five, ten thousand dollars on some cert. Yeah, I mean, you, you can learn all that concept of whatever it is for, um, you know, the PWK with pen testing with Cali from uh, OS from offensive security. You can learn that stuff from the where to hack the box and try high and they give you a certification of completion. But you know, it just comes down to your finances. If you have the money, if you have an internship or you work on a team that's willing to sponsor for your next certificate, those will be the ones I would recommend doing. That's some great advice. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, that's uh, pretty much all we have time for today. So um, if you are watching on uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitch, wherever, uh, hit us with a subscribe um, so you don't miss another show. And don't forget to check out cybery.it for um, some free courses and uh, paid ones too if uh, you're down for it. So thanks so much, Ben. Cool. Thanks so much for having me.